we'll go ahead and, and get started. Somebody did start by asking if the uh, that recording will be available, and and, and yes, we uh, we do make all of these uh, recordings available on, on our YouTube site. So please check that out. Uh, so hello everyone, and thanks for joining us today for 25 minutes with CAP Specialty Risk Management Edition. Uh, today we're going to get some perspective on a few emerging risks impacting specialty underwriting lines. We're going to talk to the impact of these issues on the craft of underwriting and then the challenges that brokers, insurers, and insured space in delivering appropriate risk management and insurance solutions. Uh, ideally, we'll shed some light on, on uh, some things that I think you're seeing if you're a broker or an underwriter that you're seeing in the marketplace, in particular policy limit management and rate adequacy and why those things remain important tools for the underwriter. Um, you know, as underwriters, if uh, if we could predict every kind of loss that we would see, our jobs would be a lot easier, and I'm sure we'd all be making a ton of money. But I've personally been in business a long time. I like to think I pay attention, and on any given day, I'm learning new things about drivers of loss. The topics we'll hit on today are not necessarily at the top of mind as loss drivers, but they're getting there. And so today, we're going to touch on deep fakes, the Biometric Information Privacy Act, or BIPA, and climate change. I'm happy to have my team from the CAP Specialty Office of the Chief Underwriting Officer here with me today, uh, each of whom have been working behind the scenes with our underwriting teams to navigate through these risks. So we're joined by my colleagues. We've got Rick Breitweiser, who is the Technical Underwriting Lead for Healthcare Professional Liability. Say hello, Rick. Hello. Emily Resch, our Technical Underwriting Lead for ENS Package. And then Heavy Sapphire, Technical Underwriting Lead for Professional Liability. Uh, and as always, if you have any questions, please drop them in the chat and I'll keep an eye on that as we go along. Um, so let's get right into it. Um, and I'd like to start with something fun. So uh, let's talk, talk about deep fakes. And, and Debbie, why don't you get us started by defining what deep fake is? Well, uh, deep fakes have been out there for a few years and we've all seen them, whether we realize that time or not. We hear them referred to in a lot of different ways deep fakes, synthetic media, cheap fakes, or shallow fakes. A uh, deep fake by any name is a video or voice recording or a picture that has either been altered or completely created from scratch using AI deep learning technology. That's the name deep fake. Deep fake software applications, which are widely available and easy to use, <clears throat> excuse me, basically learn the source space from all different angles and the characteristics of the voice print so that a video or audio recording can be altered or overlaid or swapped out or even created as a wholly new digital recording. You end up with a video or audio recording that sounds and looks just like the person in the original recording, but they're probably saying and doing things that are either subtly or radically different than the original recording. Uh, cheap fakes and shallow fakes are called that because they're usually pretty unsophisticated and they're easy to identify as being altered or as a deep fake. So there's a time when it was fun to stand next to a, like a life-size cardboard cut out of a celebrity, have your picture taken, and then try to fool your friends that you're hanging out with a famous person, actually kind of innocent. Uh, and now here we are in the 21st century uh, how are deep fakes or synthetic media being used and misused? Yeah, I know. I, I'm going to date myself now because I remember standing in a blockbuster beside a cut out of Harrison Ford to have my picture taken. But now if Harrison Ford flubs his lines during a film production, deep fake technology is a really handy tool for the film director to be able to fix that without having to resort to expensive retakes. So I'd say one of the better or more legitimate uses for deep fakes is in the film industry and maybe in advertising, so long as it's done with the right permissions in place and it's identified as synthetic media. Another industry that's finding a good use for synthetic media is in the fashion industry. Online retailers can now allow potential buyers to create a full body deep fake of themselves to virtually try on the apparel. But there are a lot of nefarious or less than savory ways that deep fakes are being used. And unfortunately, that seems to be where the growth is occurring for this type of AI. The biggest misuse is in non-consensual pornography, where a famous person's face, usually a famous actress, is integrated into a pornographic video and then gets widely distributed. This is sometimes referred to as revenge porn. And it's not limited to famous people because, well, the desire for revenge is a pretty universal human trait. 
other misuses we're seeing for deep fakes are in insurance claim fraud, like where an insured alters a video of damage to their house or business or vehicle, and then they submit it as a claim. And then you also can have financial fraud, like grandparent phishing scams and fake CEO scams. Uh, we're hearing about deep fake evidence in domestic disputes or other court cases. And then, of course, we've all seen it used in political ads, and we've seen it with the news media showing deep fake video as breaking news, and then later we find out it was really an altered video or a voice print. Sadly, once these videos make the rounds on the news or on social media platforms, it's really hard to pull it back. If the deep fake is sophisticated enough, that becomes the new reality. And deep fakes have really created a situ situation where we have to question what's real or authentic. Um, the existence and sophistication of deep fakes has created another problem, plausible deniability. If a recording is now presented as evidence of a person's crime or wrongdoing, that person can now very plausibly claim that the recording is a deep fake. Yeah, so naturally some pretty serious stuff there can create some pretty significant harm. Um, I'm not uh, losing sight of the positive uses that you mentioned at the beginning there, but um, you know, of course we're talking about the, uh, uh, the, insurance, the insurance liability risk that comes with this. So in, in making the connection to typical policy language and claims, um, I think there are a couple of close cousins, specifically the misappropriation of image claims under general liability policies, and then violations of the, you know, what I mentioned before, the Biometric Information Privacy Act, or again, BIPA. Um, so both Debbie, uh, sorry, Debbie and Emily, um, can you speak to some of the misappropriation of image cases and, and how policy language has adapted to this modern era of exposure? Uh, maybe Debbie, you want to you go first? Well, it has to adapt because there are a lot of opportunities for using synthetic media in advertising and marketing. One that you may have seen is the hectory artist Bob Ross, and he's dead, but in a new commercial where he was basically brought back to life to paint a bottle of Mountain Dew in one of his paintings. Uh, since the software is so readily available and easy to use, using a deep fake celebrity in advertising may seem like a really good idea and a great way to drive traffic to an online or brick and mortar business, especially if that video goes viral or ends up on social media. For example, you may be the owner of a bar or a restaurant and you use a deep fake Tom Cruise in a local TV ad and show him sitting at your restaurant having a meal or having a really great time mingling with the guests at your bar. Now you're looking at a misappropriation of image situation. Right. Yeah, I uh, remember several years ago, we were kind of having the low tech version of these claims with, under the CGL, where you'd have, um, you know, an employee go and find an image of a, a model or a famous person and, and they throw it on their flyer or advertising, um, often for businesses that maybe someone wouldn't want to be associated with, like the adult entertainment business, and they didn't get the appropriate permissions. Um, so uh, back then when those claims were starting to come in, a lot of insurance companies started responding with exclusions. So I think that uh, type of language is gonna need to be revisited and, and looked at to see how that's really going to apply in, in these new high-tech scenarios. Right, right. It, uh... A uh, little, 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 little crazy that one of the common themes of the nefarious uses of these things always seems to come back to sort of the adult entertainment uh, uh, area. But so, so if you, you know, if you can think of a deep fake as a virtual clone, I, I feel like in a way you're a short step away from making the clone more real by adapting biometric data. Um, so now let's touch a bit on, on some newer legislation that's aimed at protecting people from these emerging trends. And, and specifically, this is, uh, again, the Biometric Information Agency Act that I've now said about six times. Um, from now, I'm, I'm going to call it BIPA. Um, so, so Rick, uh, uh, introduce the BIPA to us. Sure. Well, um, BIPA, um, our laws enacted to safeguard the unlawful collection or storing um, of biometric information. So, we're talking about uh, retina or iris scans. We're talking about voice prints, fingerprints, palm prints, um, or any other characteristic. Uh, unique to an individual, and uh, it's um, hitting us, uh, hitting the radar a little bit because uh, while so far Illinois, Texas, Washington, California, New York 
and Arkansas have actually passed legislation on BIPA. 27 states have pending legislation, and there's even uh, um, a federal uh, legislation uh, that was put before the uh, Congressional Committee. So uh, I, I think we're going to be hearing a lot more states coming on board with this type of legislation. Yeah. So, uh, you know, people have heard about deep fakes have probably seen the Tom Cruise deep fakes. And, and then, of course, it makes one think of Mission Impossible level biometric retina scans, among other things. Um, but I, I, I realize it's not that covert, is it? You know, how, how do Main Street businesses use biometric information? Well, um, one of the examples would be using fingerprints uh, as a way for an employee to either clock in or clock out or even gain access to certain uh, types of programs within, uh, within their organization. Um, I don't know if anyone uh, on the call may be uh, uh, familiar with CLEAR. Uh, so a great thing, uh, a little retina scan, you go to the airport and you zoom right through, no more standing in that line. But that's a biometric uh, uh, you know, technology that's using uh, something very personal, of course, to you. So um, it, it, it's, it's the information um, that is being uh, gathered here is, uh, is certainly for uh, technology platforms, and as that technology uh, continues, we're going to see a growth. Right. So I, I do want to um, uh, naturally uh, translate this into the things that our, our brokers and underwriters are, are seeing you know, on a daily basis. But before we get to that, um, just to go a little bit further on BIPA, what, what are some of the typical requirements under BIPA as you've seen them so far? Right. Um, so you, uh, folks that are uh, familiar with HIPAA are going to hear things that are kind of similar here. Um, and the first is inform uh, in writing a person of what data is being collected or stored. Um, a second would be inform the person in writing the purpose and the length of time of which the data will be collected, stored, and used. Uh, you do need written consent. And um, uh, you have to detail, detail um, when you're going to destroy that when it, you don't you don't need it anymore. And of course, the big thing as we're seeing with all the cyber stuff going on is securely store it uh, because you want those biometric identifiers stored. Right. So I, I know from our discussions that the various state acts will pres uh, I'm sorry prescribe uh, specific fines and penalties and and, uh, and on their own they can be very punitive. Um, but then, of course, there's civil litigation, which is where we tend to come in on the insurance side. Um, can you give an example or examples of, of cases that have arisen from alleged BIPA violations? Um, sure. So early on, we saw some cases in Facebook, Facebook Google, Sh um, Shutterfly, um, all alleging um, uh, you took my facial image and you stored it without my consent. So there are those cases, but, you know, we won't really see those cases. So um, uh, recently, there's some that are more impactful for the, I think, for the insurance industry. Uh, and the first will be there's a tanning salon in Illinois that used a fingerprint um, uh, as a scan uh, to get into the facility in lieu of of a uh, of a card, a membership card. Um, and so uh, the problem was with it is that the business had shared that uh, the biometric information that the fingerprint with a with a vendor third party, but they didn't follow the rules. They didn't get consent. They didn't tell people about it. And all of a sudden, you have a, a, an alleged violation uh, of BIPA that could uh, you know, result in a pretty expensive lawsuit. lawsuit. Right. And so just to be clear on that, the third, because I, I remember this case, you and I talked a lot, we all talked a lot about it. Um, they weren't sharing it with a third party for the benefit of, of profiting from it. It was really just for the benefit of facilitating what they thought was a more efficient and effective uh, clocking in process or checking in process, if you will. Is that, is that right? That's correct. Um, and that's a good example of, of technology, a little bit of this great technology that we can use and help our business, but not thinking through uh, it entirely at the end. Right, right. So then um, going a little bit further on this, with respect to the insurance coverage for these cases, what coverages have been sought in these uh, in this limited set of BIPA cases that we've seen so far? So we've seen uh, cases brought for GL, um, for PL, and uh, EPLI. 
And um, the requests uh, for coverage have led to denials uh, and, and some uh, declaratory judgment litigation. Um, and most of those are involving employee exclusions because it's heavily employee used. Uh, it's interesting that that tanning salon is a, is a third party using it, so to speak, a, 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 um, a customer um, using it. So uh, we're seeing uh, that, um, and there's other exclusions such as privacy, um, et, et cetera. What happened in that tanning salon case, though, it was brought, again, by a third party, brought under CGL, and the court held that uh, the advertising injury of the CGL policy was triggered in that there was a duty to defend. And there was a second case uh, that just recently came out with uh, Church Mutual, who was uh, insuring an assisted living facility, um, where they were requiring their employees this time uh, to uh, fingerprint, um, uh, have a fingerprint scanner uh, to clock in and clock out. And uh, the employee said, hey, wait a minute, you didn't follow BIPA, you didn't get my consent, I don't know what you're doing with it. So um, uh, the carrier has, uh, has alleged uh, exclusions in their policy, which include employee exclusions and also um, exclusions for confidential information sharing. So we're, we'll wait to see what happens. But we have also seen one, uh, another carrier actually have crafted an exclusion and name it PIPA, BIPA. It's the insurance doesn't apply based upon arising out of any way related to biometric information. So uh, there's more to come. Yeah. So then lastly on BIPA anyway, um, what tips can our brokers give to their insured customers? Well, um, again, it, we're, we're, we're talking about something that is technology and technology is zooming forward so fast and these are great tools. But um, when you're dealing with a smaller business, have they recognized and are they really aware of the regulations of using that type of technology? And are they following the rules? It could be as, as simple as that. Um, and, uh, and as these cases develop, I think that as an industry, we should follow and, and, and see what the facts are so that we can decide what other further risk management tips we can give um, regarding following you know, these, these uh, statutes. Emily, any, any quick advice on that before we move on? I'm sorry, Debbie, any quick advice on that before we move on to the next uh, climate change? Well, um, I just wanted to mention that since voice prints and face prints are considered biometric information, like Rick said, it's important to be aware of regulations and follow the rules. Um, if you have an insured that is using or plans to use a person's voice print or face print to create synthetic media content, whether it's for advertising um, or for their business or they're, maybe they're an online media company or an ad agency or a film producer, some things they should keep in mind are that they should only use synthetic media with the written consent of the subject. Yeah, always clearly state that it's synthetic content. They should consider limiting the use of synthetic content, especially avoid using it to portray violence or political content or hot button controversial subjects. And definitely consult a lawyer uh, that's well versed in intellectual property and privacy issues before going down that road. Right. So, all right, um, a lot about BIPA, deep fakes. Let's uh, switch gears and bring this plane in for a landing and talk about climate change, and in particular, uh, the impact of climate change on liability insurance. So, um, Emily, uh, why don't you set the stage for us with some statistics? Sure. Um, the climate crisis is a topic that's been on the industry's radar for a while, but I really think now we're starting to see the increasing impact more concretely um, through the more frequent severe weather events that we've been experiencing. Um, just to give you some numbers of catastrophic storms and their frequency in the past decade, in the 80s, the average number of billion dollar disasters, and this is adjusted for inflation, was 2.9. In the 90s, that number was 5.3, the 2000s, 6.3, the 2010s, 12.3. In just the last five years, 16.2. And 2020 sent a re set a record of 22 billion dollar occurrences or billion dollar disaster occurring. That um, uh, it's it's hard it's hard to uh, avoid for sure, um, or or to say that it doesn't exist. So, how should we quickly orient the liability just so we can get right to the 
right to the substance of, of what we're interested in. Sure. Um, so at a high level, I kind of categorize the risks related to a climate crisis as uh, first contribution and second adaptation failure. Um, so with contribution, the risks uh, are a larger concern in the energy sector and certain manufacturing where um, there tend to be high levels of greenhouse gas emissions from companies' operations and products. Um, there's already a, a history of suits against companies for actually contributing to climate change because of their emissions or uh, for failing to comply with regulations meant to limit greenhouse gas emissions. Um, some of you may recall the uh, Volkswagen emissions scandal a few years back. Um, adaptation failure, on the other hand, really applies more broadly to just about any business. Um, and by adaptation failure, I mean, Business is failing to adapt to climate change and its effects. We're seeing increased uh, severe weather. We're seeing increased regulation related to climate change. So as we're largely a casualty writer, let's get right into what's the state of play of climate change on liability lines? Uh, yeah, until recently, you know, casualty lines probably haven't given it too much attention. It was much more of a property heaven heavy uh, risk. Um, but underwriters, I think, have really been awakened by some significant events. Uh, you know, very recently, look at the California wildfires. Um, currently, Cali California holds utilities strictly liable for damage caused by their activity or equipment. And uh, this law is probably a century old. Um, and it isn't, wasn't until the increased frequency and just devastation um, by wildfires in recent years that actually led to Pacific Gas and Electric bankruptcy in 2019. And when you think about uh, the utilities liability relating to failure to maintain lines, uh, maintain power lines, you can also think of um, contractors in general. Um, they're at a high risk given the expectation to maintain safe, safety. Um, uh, to get a little more granular, landscaping contractors that Typically, you might see as a low class risk, um, but there's really a greater risk with uh, the effects of climate change having on um, the area and the water. So um, uh, let's just dive uh, now a little bit deeper into some of the risks that we think that I, I know certainly that we see because we tend to focus more on small and mid-sized businesses, but what probably even most of our brokers and other folks out there are seeing on a day-to-day -day basis. Sure. Um, you know, another very recent example is Hurricane Ida. Um, sadly, due to very severe flooding in New York City from Ida, several people lost their lives in basement apartments where there was inadequate egress. And these types of events, um, you know, are tragedies and they're likely to give rise to several liability lawsuits, uh, especially considering that there was an expectation that landlords had learned their lesson from Superstorm Sandy. Yeah, and we also saw a group of nursing homes um, licenses that were revoked after several residents, you know, unfortunately uh, drowned or died when they were being moved to warehouses. And there was a uh, independent senior living apartments that had some death. So, um, any violation, of course, of a, of your licensure in a healthcare setting has a devastating effect on any negligence claim that could be brought. Right. Well, the insurance company and insurance agent E&O you know, side were likely to see a wave of claims like what we saw after Katrina uh, rising out of uncovered property claims for flood losses. CoreLogic has estimated that insured flood damage properties in the Northeast from Ida will be in the $5 billion to $8 billion range and uninsured property values could very well double that. Yeah, uh, big, big numbers for sure. Um, so, uh, I know we had talked about, you know, maybe wanting to get into some of the, um, uh, you know, what can our brokers and insurers understand uh, about how to mitigate these risks. Regrettably, uh, we are, uh, we're running short on, on, on time. Um, we covered a, a pretty good, pretty good range of topics here. Um, I think, um, I'd like to just close it out and, and, and make 1 comment about uh, the next 1. So, first of all, uh, I think, I've, you know, in the other ones that, that I've, I've moderated, um, we've talked about a pretty consistent theme. These are um, yet other emerging topics that I think are, are driving activity that we're seeing in the marketplace, like uh, tightening limits 
um, rate strengthening because these things need to happen because uh, particularly in the in the area of liability risks, but really across specialty underwriting in particular, I think volatility is getting greater and greater. And uh, and so you know particularly when you think about liability and uh, and the possibility of finding yourself in a lawsuit down the road, you know liability claims as most of us know they don't settle for or or fully develop for you know five years or or, or more. And so you know you need to make sure that you've got enough. Um, uh, control over your limits and enough rate in the bank in order to pay for those claims when they come five years from now. Sure enough, when when a claim settles or or um, a judgment is awarded, uh, it's going to be at whatever the current dollar valuation is. It's not going to be at at what it was when the when the accident actually occurred. Um, so these are the reason why um, you're seeing these things from the insurance market and why they need to they need to persist. That that um, responsibility needs to persist. Um, Today, we just scratched the surface on a few interesting risk topics. At our next 25 minutes with CAT uh, Risk Management Edition in November, uh, our own Mary Schust and Bill Roy are going to do a deeper dive on deep fakes and non fungible tokens, aka uh, NFTs. Um, so, listen, Rick, Debbie, Emily, thank you so much for taking the time today and, and uh, share your valuable insights on these topics. And to everybody dialing in to listen, thank you so much for supporting CAP Specialty. Thanks, everyone.